ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to attempt an experiment this morning. I'm going to make two simultaneous presentations. One is my spoken presentation, which will discuss some of the background of the multimedia, the electronics industry, and why we're here this week. The other will be a visual presentation, which will in some ways support what I'm saying, but will not be directly related to it, but will give at least some indication of the broad scope of the multimedia industry, what the components are, what the applications are, and so forth. So you have a choice. You have three choices. It's a multiple choice opportunity. You can either watch my presentation and ignore me. You can listen to my presentation and ignore the slides. Or you can be really challenged for a Friday morning and watch the slides and listen to me simultaneously. Either way, it doesn't really matter what you do. I hope you get some value out of my presentation. So let me start. If you can just let the slides now auto run. Thank you. The professional, multi the professional broadcast, or perhaps better to say, electronics multimedia. In oh, thank you. Supplies of water for me. Thank you. The, <laughs> I shall start again. The professional broadcast, or perhaps better to say, electronic multimedia industry, has in recent years changed beyond all recognition. What was at one time the exclusive domain of vast media empires, and often, in fact, usually state-owned bodies and requiring vast capital investment to service the expectations placed upon them have become service industries of all sizes, both great and very small, even to, as we will see, a broadcast television station in your very own pocket. Previously, these broadcasting corporations did their own research and development of what was a very specialized area of technology, with the results of that research and development being subject to standardization and then placed with commercial organizations to manufacture those products. These developments were usually overseen in issues of quality, performance, and standardization by international bodies such as the EBU, the NAB, the SMPTE, the IEEE, and many others. When in use in those days, teams of skilled engineers were usually required within the broadcast facility to keep this equipment working and in perfect alignment often with constant adjustment, as analog technology was the basis of the equipment at those times. In the early 1960s, for example, a color broadcast television camera of broadcast quality cost over $100,000 and required at least four people to lift it onto a substantial pedestal. Likewise, a videotape recorder something that only a few broadcasters could afford weighed many hundreds of kilos and similarly cost over $100,000. This, this, it, it, this run, it, it, it should automatically change. The seeds of change were sown in the middle 1960s as it became, with semiconductor technology, possible to convert the analog and audio and video signals into a digital form. However, at that time, the applications embracing digital solutions were strictly limited by the finite processing power, and more significantly, by the high cost of digital storage, which at that time depended largely on tape for storing significant volumes of data. The resulting applications of digital signal processing and storage of media signals remained with the professional operators, and for the large part, products were speciality tools that could not be implemented with analog solutions. Initially, time-based correct professional videotape recorders, then limited special effects. Among the first was a simple quad split, allowing four individual pictures to be simultaneously presented to the viewer within a single screen. Few of you, looking at the ages within this audience, will remember the novelty of quad split in the television coverage of the Mexico Olympic Games in 1968, long before many of you were born. From these modest starts, very sophisticated digital video effects were introduced, but remained again the exclusive tools of the broadcaster, with similarly large budgets. Digital recording eventually followed, providing the creative producers with virtually unlimited copying and multi-generation capability, without the degradation previously associated with analog recording. But these recorders still remained very expensive and the exclusive domain of the professional broadcast user. The turning point came in the late 1990s and early 2000s, 
with key enabling technologies. The ever-falling cost of solid-state memory, combined with the ever-increasing speed and processing power of very large-scale integration, and with falling costs uh, with, and with falling demands in power consumption. The result was that many tasks previously only possible with expensive computers or dedicated equipment were now and dedicated hardware, particularly image storage and manipulation, were now absorbed into consumer products, particularly the mobile phone, with the now available significant processing power, facilitating real-time data compression that in turn, with low cost and growing memory capability, offered many potential opportunities to the user. This combined with the desire to include more and more innovation to the mass market mobile phone has stimulated and driven the rapid development of these technologies, which when combined with annual sales in billions of units, has seen ever falling unit costs. It's no stretch of the imagination to say that the smartphone or camera that sits in your pocket today far exceeds the performance of those professional cameras and recorders that I mentioned in my opening remarks, and at a cost of only a few hundred dollars and weighing little more than a few hundred grams. But the revolution goes it further than this simple statement, that the consumer products can now achieve much, or even all, that was hitherto the province of the professional user. The consumer is now empowered and aware of the opportunities that exist, and the consumer industry is now driving and steering innovation. But not always for the best or the most obvious of reasons. And this I will return to shortly. So it is, as I have suggested, that digital power, with its continuously falling cost and ever-increasing capabilities, has become the enabling technology that feeds creativity and product development within the electronic media industry. But that technology is now largely the servant of the consumer and the consumer industry, with the professional broadcaster and media producer often only a beneficial bystander. The consumer product is now the driver and is pulling the professional broadcaster and media creator along with it to deliver what the consumer wants, and often along the way identifying opportunities that established media industry has not foreseen. It should not be overlooked, however, that it is often the consumer industry that creates in the mind of the user the need for something new. It's also worthy to note that often the professional video and audio solutions are increasingly derived from mass market consumer products. You have only to look, for example, at typical camcorders these days. They are based on consumer products with some degree of professional sophistication added to them. The mobile phone, as a typical example, now has all the capabilities that could previously only be achieved by studio cameras and professional recorders, or even an entire production facility, and often with higher performance achieved with that mobile phone. Even the role of the traditional broadcaster with free-to-air transmission to a vast populace is steadily being eroded. Digital broadcasting has allowed many channels to be accommodated within the radio spectrum that was previously occupied by a few analog channels. For the consumer, the internet has further extended the delivery options, offering a broadcast station in your pocket, something that I mentioned earlier. All contained within the mobile phone with applications such as Periscope that give the individual the ability to stream live video and audio from their phone, effectively becoming a personal broadcaster. A demonstration of just how capable the modern smartphone is was undertaken a couple of years ago by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, who used the opportunity in a TV program entitled Click that features new technology and gadgets to produce capture, record, edit, and deliver a full-length program reporting on the Barcelona-based World GSM conference and exhibition. Relying solely on several smartphones as cameras, recorders, and basic consumer software to edit, it was achieved, not without some difficult moments, I would hasten to add, but usually relating surprisingly to audio editing and audio capabilities rather than the video facilities provided by the mobile phone. Nevertheless, it was achieved and of suitable quality for broadcasting in high definition. The consumer now seems to be, as one would hope, the master of this new media landscape. But I would like to suggest 
that this may not always be the case and that at times the motives of the consumer industry are often driven forward by consumer market demands and needs to be carefully monitored and observed. Clearly the consumer market has a need to create market demand. As with products now costing in real terms a fraction of what, for example, a colour television set cost in the 1960s, it is now affordable and easy for the consumer to purchase and to rapidly saturate the market, with the resulting need for the industry to create something new, either a product, a technology, or even an expectation. I believe I once read that the life cycle of a product such as a mobile phone or similar consumer product is on average only seven months before the need to add something new to counter a competitor's action and so retain market position. So the creativity is very fast indeed. The same also applies to in-home viewing. The manufacturer needs to constantly revitalize to maintain product sales. In recent years alone, new technologies have appeared often before many users have absorbed the previous offerings. For example, high-definition television that at one time never seemed to arrive was, before even being fully established in many parts of the world, being challenged by 3D television and the industry creating a demand without either fully understanding of the social and physiological issues and often without even considering the availability of 3D content. But that's perhaps not a surprise. For the last 100 years, 3D entertainment has appeared almost routinely, only to shortly afterwards disappear, not into oblivion, but perhaps into some dormant state for a while. More recently, 4K resolution was demonstrated and proposed as a future path for, exclu for exclusive use by the professional applications. Yet again, before 4K content was widely available, 4K receivers are already being marketed to the unsuspecting consumer with the implied benefit that quality would be higher irrespective of the content resolution and with the broadcast expected to catch up and to offer services and content. And now 8K seems to be following very close behind if previous trends are to be an indicator. So HD, then 4K, very quickly became available on mobile phones and other consumer camera products. Yet only a few years ago, 2K cameras were available solely to the professional broadcaster and at commensurately high prices. So yet again an indication that the consumer product is capable of driving the professional industry. To add further complexity to the broad landscape that is now developing, the broadcasters and indeed probably also those providing delivery channels, terrestrial, satellite or internet, are now, being, now becoming increasingly concerned that the rising expectations of resolution are providing unsustainable demands on restricted and precious spectrum. So not unexpectedly, an alternative is currently being sought that is under the general banner of better pixels. So what are better pixels? This can include, for example, high dynamic range that adds less data overhead than, say, doubling the revolution, particularly when contemporary data compression and modulation techniques have probably reached or are very close to their theoretical limits. New display colorimetry is also now in the pipeline that will extend the achievable color gamut, but will clearly need to be matched with equivalent image capture colorimetry and remain compatible with the existing displays for the future. It seems never to stop. Virtual reality to immersive sound, where can it stop? Possibly, so long as mankind has imagination, it will never stop. Games consoles and now mobile phones have adopted virtual reality into the consumer market. Hitherto only the realm of expensive flight and military simulators. Yet it's important to recognize that again, all too often, it is the motives of market demand and profit that drive and in many cases create the apparent requirement rather than any research need, and often with little understanding of the social and physiological issues presented. For example, 3D TV, requiring socially inconvenient viewing glasses and edge of field vision issues. Is it time to consider the viability of virtual reality outside some games and simulate applications? Does it have a real place in the consumer industry and the consumer entertainment arenas? Or will it, like 3D, become a transient novelty. 
Yet, with affordable products based on mobile phones, augmented with simple and inexpensive viewers, such as Google Cardboard, the experience is being rapidly and widely shared. Who will lead this innovation? The games developers? The tourist industry? Education? The possibilities are enormous. But as I have said earlier, innovation in innovation is the consumer who is being educated and established as the driver and commander of innovation, even if they do not fully appreciate what they are looking for. Nevertheless, the price benefits of the mass market of the consumer industry cannot be dismissed, as this will surely facilitate other professional applications in virtual reality that will extend from education to medical training and indeed real remote surgery, flight simulators and similar applications and certainly many other possibilities as yet unforeseen or unimagined. The capabilities and speed of signal processing available to the ICT world have now become sufficiently fast and powerful to provide a real and acceptable alternative for carrying, switching, processing digital video and audio that was hitherto essentially a digital representation of an analog stream. Now, internet protocol becomes the standard development for the future for distribution, switching, routing, and processing signals within the studio environment. So the initial delivery over the internet employing IP has evolved into multiple applications with production and studio facilities, internet protocol delivering the essential tasks, as I say, of distribution, routing, and other data handling and processing, replacing the hitherto dedicated routing matrices and other equipment. But these ICT-derived solutions need to respect the absolute real-time nature of video and audio. If you wait, for example, for a few hundred milliseconds for a Google search to fill the screen, it's not a problem. But a similar delay in switching video or audio would seem to be an eternity and unacceptable. The merging of media and ICT and bringing the tools, technologies and skills of ICT are to be welcomed. But what I foresee is an essential need and education of ICT technologists to appreciate the requirements of the media industry and for those in the field of ICT to be inspired by the needs and opportunities of the multimedia and professional video, audio and cinematography production applications. Alternatively, there may be a need for visionaries or techno-evangelists who can identify opportunities, see the applications, and explain those needs to the ICT technologist for implementation. I would like to see us embrace these new technologies and the opportunities it will bring, but I would also like to offer a word or two of caution. In the last half century, video recording and digital imaging have largely replaced, and in most cases benefited from, in terms of cost and quality, the traditional processes of film and photography. Yet in that same time, professional video recording has transitioned from two-inch quadruplex recording through a series of ever smaller and more compact and lower cost formats to now few, if any, tape-based recorder solutions. Most content is now recorded as files on disk or solid-state memory. And even here, the evolution from large floppy disks to massive hard drives frequently with different recording and data formats. Many of these, like obsolete video recorders, can no longer be reproduced, partly from the absence of working and appropriate format players, partly from deterioration of the recording media, and partly from the lack of technicians who can operate and maintain these machines. And the same situation is very similar within the consumer market, from VHS through many other formats to DVD to solid state recording, with the result that human memories and experiences are being lost. Family memories, historic memories and experiences, even social memories. Yet amazingly, 35 millimeter and other film formats, both professional and consumer, from over 100 years ago, can still be viewed. The content of the image can at the very least be evaluated with nothing more than an eye and a source of light. At the same time, a photo album remains both important records of history and a valuable family treasure. What legacy will digital leave? In the race to have the latest and apparently the best image technology, 
is in fact perhaps casting history into oblivion. Consider for a moment just one issue, the digital photo. Dedicated camera or phone, it does not matter. It's cheap and in terms of consumables, virtually free and instantly available. Literally billions of pictures are taken every year, but how many are ever seen again after the very brief display on screen at the time of capture? Very few, if any of these images, are ever printed. And unlike past times, where the necessity to have all 36 images on a reel of 35 millimeter film processed and printed to see the results, these were then at least retained and remained available for future generations and irrespective of the technical content or quality and so often bringing pleasure to a family to look at these half a century or more later. Will the same apply with digital recording and with digital imaging? I suspect not unless precautions are put in place now. The conclusion that I would like to bring is that the broadcast and media industry is too often driven by consumer needs and profit and market share concerns that are imposed by the consumer manufacturing industry and not always well based on social and physiological requirements nor indeed human desires and limitations. To this I will add that digital is in a danger of condemning visual history to an existence measured only in milliseconds as the permanence of the photographic image is displaced. Future generations may see the 21st century as the dark ages where no pictorial records can be seen by the average person except perhaps in specialist museums. Yet at the same time, I'm very sure that digital imaging can and will bring many benefits and many opportunities if they're correctly identified, harnessed and exploited. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, if you, um, uh, Martin is a very uh, um, experienced person. I should say that uh, I, 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 it's to reach biography. I just know Martin as a, a chairman of uh, first chairman. He was for many years a chairman of international broadcast conference which is held annually in Amsterdam. You know it is the second largest show in the world in the field of uh, broadcast technologies. And uh, this exhibition is about 50,000 people, 50,000 every year, and about 1,000 in the conference, I think, something like this. Yes, so uh, Martin is speaking here a bit, uh, in, the, in front of uh, 50 people, but sometimes he speaks at the conference with 1,000 people in very, very big hall in Amsterdam. I well was there. So he's very experienced in the uh, broadcast industry. And he also was for many years, uh, uh, and probably now, uh, ch chair of uh, International Association of Broadcast Manufacturers. So uh, it is Association of uh, Broadcast e uh, Manufacturing Industry. So this person is very, uh, I would say, experienced. So uh, I, I, pr I propose that I take this chance to ask questions to this very e experienced person. <laughs> Probably he, he, he shares his view of industry. And we know at this moment, as I understand from the speech of uh, Martin, and uh, we know it, that now it is um, some kind of, uh, for broadcast industry, it is an important uh, moment because uh, some kind of uh, disruptive technologies are coming, which change the business models. Now, uh, much more mobile communications, much more internet, much more, uh, many young people, I see a lot of young people here, uh, probably some students, looks like internet, not uh, linear TV. But anyway, uh, but broadcast technologies and broadcast industry do not want to give up. They would like to <laughs> evolve further. So this is a very interesting moment of this. So I suggest that you should ask questions uh, to Martin and uh, probably Martin will uh, give some answers. So uh, please, do you have any questions? Or yes, please. Uh, oh. Uh, yes, just want to find out how the broadcast industry is handling all these uh, disruptive technologies where people are viewing uh, broadcasts and so on over the internet on their smartphones as opposed to the television. No, 
I'll, I'll try that one word. The, the, it, are we working? Yes. There's a, an English expression which is, if you can't beat them, join them. And I suspect that, to a large extent, is what many broadcasters are doing. Um, they are, first of all, making their over-the-air or their directly transmitted content available via the internet, via either catch-up television, or in many cases, condensed or short version programs, again, for simple browsing and viewing. The attention span of watching a television program that used to be perhaps 60 minutes, 90 minutes or longer, is now measured just in a few minutes, perhaps 15 to 17 minutes is the typical viewing time. Equally, people would sit down in the past and watch television. Now, they're multitasking. They're perhaps snacking on a meal, they're snacking on their mobile phone, on a tablet, and also watching television. So I think the answer to your question is that many broadcasters around the world, having realized that they will lose market share, and many of them being commercial organizations requiring viewers to attract advertising, are accommodating that and providing media delivery via the internet, via short form content, via mobile phone, which can be viewed when people are traveling, when they're at home, whether they're in their student accommodation, whether they're in their bedroom, whether they're with their family. So, as I say, is to try and emulate what others are doing. But it's nevertheless true that the days of an audience for a typical program, for example, in the United Kingdom, we used to measure audience participation in, hun in tens of millions, perhaps seven to 15 million viewers watching a key program. Now, if a program has 60,000 viewers, it's still considered successful because there is so much choice. The fear that I've always had in the past is that as multiple channels became available, there would either be more and more repetition of programs or dilution of content. Because I'm a firm believer that in this world, there is only a finite amount of talent, of people that can write programs, can write scripts, create, and can direct. And if you try to create more, you end up with dilution. Um, so it's content multiplication. Okay, so please, more questions to Martin. Okay, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really interesting. And um, I'd like to ask your opinion about uh, further ways. Uh, you know, uh, right now uh, we can observe some contradiction between uh, internet broadcasting and uh, television and uh, some kind of uh, content creation uh, when uh, video bloggers uh, create content and uh, uh, com make a competition uh, with big uh, companies like BBC, CNN and so on. And uh, in the same, uh, th this is point from uh, the core of uh, the networks internet or television network and uh, uh, periphery uh, computers uh, tv sets and so on uh, how do you think first of all uh, whether these two uh, groups will make uh, some kind of union and uh, or maybe some replacement or something like this and from uh, which uh, road it will happen from the core or from the periphery? I, I think, again, like so many questions, there's no single simple answer. I think the small independent, as you say, video bloggers, have a very strong and important place within the industry because they can provide content for a very small minority audience. You know, it may be perhaps a very specialist musical interest or very special literary interest or a very particular creative interest of some sort. And it's not in the interest nor in the benefit of the large broadcasters to try and assimilate and to put that into their airtime and their airspace. At the same time, as I indicated in my previous answer, you know, the large broadcasters are to a degree having to accommodate to the very changing viewing patterns and to provide their own supporting material, so that you can watch a program over the air or by the internet, but at the same time you can find a website which is providing a lot of further additional information. I watched a very, pres very interesting presentation a little while back from the company who run and operate the Twitter um, account, and they now 
feed live information to the broadcasters, <coughs> excuse me, for advertising purposes, of what are the viewer reactions to the program that's being transmitted. They can see, not by reading the messages, but they can see if a certain thing happens in a particular program, the volume of Twitter messages rises. They know a lot of people are interested in discussing at that point. So I think the answer to your question is, you know, both will continue to exist. They will probably proliferate. I mean, I would think there's probably no way of knowing how many small independent video blogs that are now in the world which are fulfilling very small specialist needs and only sort of spread through word of mouth from one person to another. Okay, okay thank you, uh, Martin. So uh, I'm a question, okay? Uh, hi. I have one question regarding the word uh, broadcast or broadcasting. Actually, we need it. Do we need the broadcast at all? So when you take a look on the internet, actually all internet networks are constructed or built almost without broadcasting. So there are only small minor uh, cases where we really need broadcasting. Uh, for remaining uh, activities, we don't need broadcasting at all. So maybe we should understand that there will be a limited amount of good movies, so you cannot produce a lot of movies, although there will be more and more good movies and good TV shows, just because we'll have the automatic translation, so we'll have the content available for all over the people all over the world, disregard of the language within is pr produced. Uh, we, at some time, at some point in time, we'll also have some uh, artificial intelligence which will be probably able to produce or try to produce if not movies then maybe a short uh, TV shows or this kind of stuff so maybe we just should to say that broadcasting doesn't exist anymore and we don't need broadcast anymore uh, we only need a good uh, content producer we need a good infrastructure for delivering this content produ uh, this content which is produced but maybe we need a little bit of tweaking the technology for for that to synchronizing video and audio and to solving some small but to be honest really small issues from the technical point of view and we don't need broadcasting at all anymore i think the answer to your question and i'm, I'm not being facetious but i think the answer to your question is there's a problem with the english language and the problem with the English language is that we don't have an alternative word for broadcasting. And I mean, even the association which I'm involved with, you know, the IABM, it's the International, International Association of Broadcasting Manufacturers, we've carefully dropped that full title and just call ourselves the IABM now because broadcasting has taken on a different connotation. If you look in the Oxford English Dictionary at the word broadcasting, the first definition, surprisingly, is a farming definition. And it's the farmer who has the basket of seed in front of him and throws the seed out across the field, spreading in days before modern technology. And it's broadcasting, casting something broadly. So I would argue that although our current understanding of the word broadcaster tends to imply large organizations, you know, either state bodies or Sky or other large corporations. Broadcasting still retains its need to be able to reach the furthest quarters and furthest corners, even if only to small markets. I think also the, the broadcaster, you know, the state broadcaster or the large commercial broadcaster, there still will remain some key elements which cannot simply and easily be replaced by independent media channels, and I choose the word carefully. And those are, first of all, news. There's very little commercial value in news. It's a news alone channel, with perhaps one example or one exception of CNN in the United States. But I would argue that that doesn't always provide you know, true international news. So the state broadcaster or the large broadcaster still has a valuable service of providing news. The large broadcasters also still have the value of providing very high budget programs. And again, there have been very good and very obvious cooperations between different broadcasters of different countries recently to put together very high budget programs. But already we're beginning to see, and certainly in the United Kingdom, 
the major broadcasters, the BBC and independent television, I won't say being threatened, but certainly being challenged by companies like Netflix, Prime from Amazon, and others who have the budget and have the money and they have the advertiser loyalty to put together very high budget programs and very high budget productions. Now, the question is, are they broadcasters? They're not broadcasters in the way that we would tend to think of, you know, the television center at Austin Kino or the television center in the United Kingdom or in France. But they are nevertheless broadcasters. They're reaching a wide audience. It may not be a large audience always, but it's a wide audience. So I think the answer to your question is we need a new word in not just the English language, but in every language which replaces the word broadcast, and which is why I tend to try and use, if I can, you know, multimedia or electronic media. And I think electronic media is probably a better definition in that that then covers satellite, terrestrial, internet, whatever the distribution media happens to be. Okay, I was satisfied. Okay, so uh, are there any more questions? Okay, Martin, probably okay. then I, I will ask a question. So um, there are uh, some talks, and for example, you know that the uh, leader of technical model of, uh, model of DVB was Ulrich Reimers, and I know that uh, his group uh, investigated some approaches to convergence of broadcast and broadband networks, like overlay networks. The idea was that uh, we have existing infrastructure of terrestrial television networks, for example. On one uh, hand, it is low power, uh, high, excuse me, high power, high tower network. And on the other hand, we have uh, cellular mobile networks. But cellular mobile networks uh, has uh, differences. At first, it is low power, low tower. We have a lot of uh, stations, but they are quite small because uh, uh, mobile communications is usually bidirectional, and that is why they cannot be very large cells. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, probably uh, some people know uh, there is broadcast uh, broadcast scenario and broadcast standards in new 3GPP uh, 3GPP standards. This service is evolved multimedia broadcast multicast service, EMBMS. So in 3GPP release uh, 14, I think, it is very uh, advanced service. So uh, actually uh, now uh, terrestrial network of uh, mobile operator also capable to make broadcasting, not only unicast. The problem of unicast that each uh, smartphone receives its pers personal data. And if there are many people look streaming, the cell very soon saturated. Yes. But broadcast is sent one signal to many people. And the idea behind this uh, broadcast broadband convergence is that uh, some part of uh, ter existing terrestrial networks can be used as for broadcast services and to mobile terminals as well. And there are some future extension frames in DVB-T2, for example, that can be used for this. Uh, what do you think about the future of this idea? So uh, does this have future or it is actually did? I mean, so it is good idea, but we know like with DVB-H standard, for example, it was developed, very good idea, but it did not work, not technically. Technically, it was worked perfectly. DVB-H, I, I should say DVB-H is uh, uh, mobile broadcasting to mobile telephones. It was not successful. There were terminals from Nokia, from many companies, but uh, for operators of mobile networks, it was not interesting. They have another business model. They actually sell traffic, not uh, advertisement on the, on the TV channels. So it was not nice. So what is your opinion? Uh, what is the future? Is there a future for this convergence scenario? A, a challenging and a very difficult question, Dimitri. Uh, probably the answer is that yes, there is a future, but the future may not be a logical conclusion. And what I mean by that is that if we look at the radio spectrum, which has historically belonged to, come back to, that one works better, does it? If, if we, I'm not sure, it may be my voice rather than the microphone. Um, if, we, if we look back at what has happened to the very valuable spectrum from the analog era, 
you know, broad brand transmission, you know, five to six megahertz of radio spectrum just to deliver one channel. That now delivers many, many more channels. But at the same time, governments, commercial organizations and others have become increasingly aware of the real monetary value of the radio spectrum. And more and more of that spectrum is being sold off in different countries. And I think the challenge that you know, we have, and I say we, we the general public, we the consumers, we the users of media, is to take up the opportunities that exist and use them. Because otherwise governments, and it doesn't matter whether it's a government in Russia, a government in the United Kingdom, in France, in Italy, in Singapore, or wherever in the world, if they see that the radio spectrum is not being fully exploited, they will put up a case to auction that off and to sell that radio spectrum for further and more mobile applications. But think for one moment, is that such a bad thought? Because if there's more spectrum available for mobile communications, there's more bandwidth available for mobile content delivery. And to go back to Dimitri's comment earlier, that DVB-H failed, I think, I don't know why it failed, I think it failed possibly because it did not deliver to the consumer the type of content that they wanted. What was delivered to the consumer was probably to be found on YouTube. But at that time, could not be fully used because of the high cost and the restricted bandwidth available with particularly 2G and then it developing 3G services. But now that we have 4G and shortly to come 5G, and 5G will again demand more spectrum to be stolen perhaps from the broadcasters, that spectrum, although reassigned, can still be available to the broadcaster. So the broadcaster, the consumer, the mobile phone operator, the telecoms operators, the state legislators, the PTTs need to look at the future of how and what are the public demands and how that media content is going to be delivered. Because as one thing's for sure, the consumer, the general public, will find that content somewhere, either through YouTube, through the internet, or whatever means they can. So I'm not sure that really answers your question, Dimitri, but I think you know, it's often the economics of the governments. I mean, in the United Kingdom, when we first sold the 3G spectrum, the government made more money through selling that spectrum than I think it probably did from taxation of the public. I see. Okay, thank you. So are there any questions to uh, Martin? Uh, okay. Uh, no. Oh, yeah, one more question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I may misunderstand something, but uh, you said that the uh, consumer uh, requests uh, nowadays, which uh, bring us more and more technologies, can often uh, contradict with the sociological needs or even with human desires. But I was just wondering how is that possible if uh, consumers are supposed to be people? So, like, are we really giving people what they want, but not what they need? Or is this even more complicated? Thank you. Okay. I, uh, my comment very specifically related in that occasion to 3D television, where there was a, decided, or a decision made by the consumer industry that they had an opportunity to sell more television receivers by offering 3D televisions. Without perhaps fully understanding, is 3D something which can be used within the home? Is 3D something which was particularly wanted? Particularly as we've already discussed this morning, more and more content being consumed on a mobile phone, more and more content being consumed on the move, and less and less content being consumed in the home. So I suspect consumer knows what is good for him or her, what they want to take up and to use at any given time once it's been offered to them. But I think at times we have to be a little cautious that the manufacturing industry sees what it believes is an opportunity to create market opportunity and market demand without really fully having research whether there is a need for that market. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we, we may ask the last question, if, if if someone have one more question. Okay, no more questions. So let's uh, then, <laughs> Martin. Thank you for thank your you. for your presentation.